Is snack time with your kids more like struggle time in your household? Well, today we're talking about all things snack time, specifically over the summer with your children, whether they're home all day and they used to be at school more often. How can you create structure and routine around this time of day when they're having snacks? So they're not just having snacks all day and not hungry at mealtime. And so you can continue to instill healthy habits and approaches to food for your children without being controlling. In this episode, you get to hear from Ashley Smith, who's a registered dietitian nutritionist, specifically works with children and families so they can learn how to find freedom, flexibility, and fun while moms feed their families. She's the host of the Veggies and Virtue podcast, which is a top ranked podcast for nutrition, where she equips moms with the know-hows and hacks that they need to continue to feed their families well. Um, In this episode specifically, we talk about parent and child feeding responsibilities and how we often get those roles reversed. Um, I've even done that. You get to hear a funny story about what I just experienced, and we kind of actually dig into that problem so we can address the structure after the fact. We talk about how food can bring peace to your household and how that should be the spot that you work from. And lastly, we also talk about what to approach first. It's often not what it is that you're feeding your children, but the when and the where. So buckle up. This is a great episode. You're going to be so equipped and informed when it comes to snack time with your children by the end. So without further ado, here is Ashley Smith. Hey friend, welcome to the Tough Love Mom podcast. You are here because deep down, you know that you were made to do hard things. Whether hard for you is getting motivated, losing weight, testing your mental and physical limits, simply taking control of your health, or all of the above. You want to learn the right way to approach all of this while also getting encouraged along the way. My name is Liz, and I've been where you are. I gained a lot of weight in my pregnancies, but with consistency in the right habits and a realistic mindset, I lost the weight sustainably and became the healthiest I'd ever been. We are capable of so much more than we think. You are not a hot mess mom that rides the struggle bus. You're here because you're different. And my mission is to help you realize just how capable you are. If you're ready to take control of your health, challenge your mindset, and be inspired by moms who have done hard things, you are in the right place. You're about to transform your life, my friend. Get pumped up. It's tough love time. Thank you, Ashley, for being on today to share all things healthy meals and snacks over the summertime for our kids and um, just everything that that entails, both as moms and, you know, within our household. So if listeners didn't get to hear you on this podcast back in episode 54, which feels like feels like years ago, but at the same time, it feels like yesterday I had you on the podcast last, um, will you just share your initial experience like that? pivotal moment for you as a mom feeding your firstborn, um, being a registered dietitian and how it made veggies and virtues what it is today. Can you share that story? Yeah, absolutely. So I think with experience in pediatric nutrition and always having really lofty ambitions of what it would be like once I was a mom, I know all of us can attest to these things that we say it will be like, or it will never be like as a mom. And then we become a mom and we all get to, you know, eat a nice slice of humble pie But with my firstborn, it was definitely one where as a dietitian, I thought breastfeeding was going to be this like beautiful, natural, easy process. And it was anything but that from the very get go. um, She had a lot of issues latching. We saw several specialists. She couldn't gain weight. It was just horrendous so much so that I ended up with a wound back attached to my breast and it was for, I was forced to stop nursing. So it was about as traumatic. And I share only those details to say it was about as traumatic and unnatural and not beautiful as possible. And so I think that kind of started to make me realize I could have six years of education and however many letters behind my name and an understanding of pediatric nutrition, but the application and the art of it was going to be changed so much just by motherhood. 
and that understanding that really that empathy that comes from only once you are a mom or you're really involved in the life of a child in that capacity. And so um, from nursing was really challenging. And then even the introductions of solids, you know, this, my oldest is now nine, but at that time, baby led weaning was a very foreign concept in the States. And the only reason I even really knew about it was because I had a colleague from the UK and she had exposed me to it. And so my my daughter really struggled with purees and solids. And so it was like, even just introducing solids didn't go the cookie cutter kind of pattern and predictable way that I had assumed. And, and by, you know, we started doing baby led weaning. And even then we started seeing pickiness as early as like nine months. And it was like, what is like, nothing was working. You know, I'm flying in salmon from Seattle, where I'm from to homemade baby food. Like I was doing all the right things, but it was, nothing was working. And then just as a mom, I think it helped me realize that as parents, we can, Sometimes we know what to do and we can theoretically do all the right things. And yet it, we don't necessarily get the outcome that we thought we were going to get. And I think with the heart behind veggies and virtue was just this compelling conviction of if I have this education and in theory, you know, have worked in, you know, some of the top pediatric hospital in the world and have, have had the hands-on clinical experience to know what to do. And it still feels this hard and this disheartening. And this challenging for me as a mom, surely other moms have to be struggling too. And they have to be struggling with not only what to do, because obviously there is a learning gap for a lot of those who haven't been trained in pediatric nutrition, but also there's just that, that challenge that as moms we face, because we want to do the right thing. And if we know the right thing to do, and then we don't get the right outcome, we begin kind of questioning ourselves. We all know as moms, you know, that self-doubt. And I love that you talk so much about mindset on this show, but I think that it was Yes, as much the meals and the snacks and the tactical and practical of feeding our families, but it was also really like the mindset aspect of motherhood and how that plays into the impact on our feeding environment and how we can, you know, ultimately shape healthy eaters. So kind of just sharing that transparent journey of, look, I, I know what to do and this is not happening the way I wanted it to happen, but I'm going to take you alongside and I'm going to kind of share you share with other people, my lessons learned was really a lot of the heart behind veggies and virtue because I was staying home. And so I didn't necessarily have the professional outlet at the time, but it seemed like, you know, this is something that I need to share so that others can feel hopefully less guilty when things don't go according to their plan and things like that. And can feel like they have someone who's a little bit more in their corner to yes, speak to the evidence-based side of how to do things and what to feed your kids and that that nutritional side, but also, as I often say on my podcast and with my community, it's evidence-based, but it's grace-laced. We have to look at it through a lens that knows how to adapt for the real life elements that aren't textbook perfect. Yeah. Which gosh, darn it. If that's not how we need to approach everything in our world now that you're a mom, because you know, when it comes, I mean, I feel like everything you're saying applies to what I speak to in the sense of my own journey and moms that listen to my podcast moms. It's like whatever a obstacle, whatever topic we're currently facing as a mom, there has to be that this is what I'm supposed to do, but how do I actually apply it to my life right now with my current circumstances? And it does take grace. And I love that you, you share that veggies and virtue is grace laced because you have to give that ability to be flexible and be realistic. I think that's like that underlying word is just realistic approach to whatever it is that you're taking on. Um, we were laughing the other day I was sharing with you. And I think if anyone follows me on Instagram, you probably saw it, but I pulled out a bunch of applesauce pouches from our couch. (laughs) That was an impressive number. I do have to say that was an impressive number to be hiding in a couch. Yeah. I had no idea he was treating it as a trash can the last nine months we've lived here. So that was about nine months worth of hidden applesauce pouches. Um, Not because he was hiding them, but because he didn't want to take them to the trash can when he finished. (laughs) He just realized that there's a slot in the couch for a reason. And it's a perfect place for an empty pouch of applesauce. Exactly. And all of the lids too. Um, and we actually ended up, we were getting some sugar ants and I was like, where the heck are these going? I need to find the root problem. Well, golly, I found it, <laughs> but it helped me realize, um, cause I listened to your podcast and you talk a lot about like routine and like, I know this is, and here's the thing. And I hope moms realize like, I'm just as human as you, but I know that it's probably best 
to offer my children snacks in like a, a structured way. Like, Hey, it's snack time. Like what they do at school, right? At preschool. Hey, it's snack time. We're going to sit down and have our snack and focus on eating. And then we're going to move on and do something else. Cause even I know as a, as like a grown adult, it's not healthy for me to be distracted while I'm eating because then you can overeat. Then you can not be actually like chewing your food. You, it, there's so many things that can go wrong when you're distracted when, and as an adult, So I'm sitting here going, well, I should probably turn the TV off. I should probably not just let them free range eat wherever and whenever they want. Um, I know that in my brain, four and a half years into motherhood, it's just hard to apply it. So I just, you know, we had moved. I'm parenting two boys. I'm running my podcast in a business. I'm like, it's okay. Like, this is something I'll be graceful with for myself until I realized there were literally 30 applesauce pouches in our couch. And that was the moment of me going, I need to create structure around snack time. (laughs) I guess I need to do that now. And I think we all have those pivotal moments, whether it's our own journey or parenting in whatever topic parenting comes up. Um, But (laughs) I know we were laughing about that because I'm sure you are like, it just takes the discipline to do it and follow through. And I'm learning that now. And thankfully my husband and I are on the same page when it comes to snack time. Um, Sorry if you can hear the thunder in the background. Southeast right now is insane. But anyways, when it comes to like snack time, especially in the summer when everyone's home and it's just straight parenting all day, Hey mommy, I I want this. I need this. Um, and some moms, you know, you're home all year with your kids, whatever it is, what kind of routine should families be trying to follow or like put in place when it comes to snack time, especially, but even mealtime, Um, so it's not that whole, like free range all day, pantries open, fridges open, have whatever you want. And then they're not even eating meals. Cause that's actually a struggle we were facing too, was we're eating five snacks. Um, I think you call them like level one snacks or, um, in your snack guide that we'll talk about later, but that's been really helpful for me because I was like, Oh, my kids are eating all these like tiny snacks throughout the day. And then they're not actually hungry at mealtime. Um, so what kind of routines can parents put in place? to help foster not just a healthier routine over the summer, but just like a natural approach to how our bodies want to be eating anyways. Yeah, absolutely. So I think some of the things you were saying, even with the applesauce example in the couch is, you know, going back to what I was sharing with what I thought as a mom, I think there's this element of like, we think nutrition is such a calculated science and there's just like a perfect way to do it. But I think if families can see like what helps maintain the peace in our home, it can kind of help give parents some framework to what needs to be fixed and what is doing okay. Because I think going into being a mom, I would have thought like my kids have these perfectly balanced meals and snacks, perfectly timed that are like perfectly consumed and everything gets eaten and enjoyed. And everything is like, like I had such an idealistic view that I think I had to then be like, Oh, my kid might eat four applesauce pouches today. Like, and it might not be at the time I scheduled and it'll probably get shoved in the couch. And I mean, like all of us moms have these examples of it doesn't finish. It it never, um, excuse me, it never, you know, looks exactly like that really perfect view. So I think going into what is a routine, it's important for families to know, just like any summer bucket list a family might come up with, you know, it's not just about like checking the boxes and being like, okay, am I doing this? But it's about making sure like, is this functional? Is this restoring or maintaining the peace in the home? Because I think before diving into the answer to your question of like what type of structure and routine is needed, it's important for families to see what problems are you having now? Because those are the places where you're lacking peace. And so I can give you kind of the cookie cutter. This is like the perfect gold standard of like on paper, what parents should do. And that's, you know, what I went into parenting thinking would be done in my home. And yet I know that the times that as parents, we need to pivot our approach is often when we're having problems, like you said, that our kids are coming to meals, not hungry. That's a problem. And that's often linked to the routine or lack thereof. You might see that, okay, I found 30 empty pouches of applesauce in the couch and we're getting sugar ants. This is a problem. So what about our feeding meal or snack routine is perpetuating that problem? And so I think if parents start with what they're bigger pain points are first, especially going into summer, it's going to help kind of create the routine for one in and of itself. But one of the biggest things I see working with families one-on-one is it also helps give parents 
and I tend to work with moms specifically, but either parent. And thankfully, as you said, your husband's on board and things like that, but it helps parents feel that reassurance that they can stick with it. Because I think a lot of moms are doubting themselves of like, if I don't know why I'm doing this, it's really hard for me to even stay consistent with doing this because honestly it's work. I mean, it's just easier to let our kids run into the pantry, get, grab a package of goldfish and take it to this, that, or the other. And we wonder why we're finding, you know, obviously we'll be talking, we're joking about the applesauce patches here, but I have a lot of clients where they're like, I just feel like I'm walking around the house with a trash can, finding little bits and pieces of snacks everywhere. And come summer, most of us are finding it because of all the ants that are finding the food before we do. And so I think for, for parents to kind of have that extra clout of this is why I want to be consistent with it, because it's not really, it may have a perception of ease, but it's not really perpetuating peace. So if if parents can kind of see like, where are the problems happening, then they can work backwards to see where do we need to establish more structure or routine. And so something when we move into the summer months specifically, usually, you know, there's different feeding responsibilities. And I know this is something you and I talked about before um, we started recording, but there's different feeding responsibilities. And there are four core areas that families usually have some sort of a struggle. And that might be what your kids are eating, when your kids are eating, where your kids are eating, or if whether and how much they're eating. And so we can kind of dive into this a little bit more later, but there's different roles and responsibilities for the parents and the child. But oftentimes if a family realizes there's a problem or there's a lack of peace regarding one of those four areas, that's where we really need to address the routine component of if, you know, just sticking to some of the examples that you shared, if your child's coming to ask for 17 snacks between breakfast and lunch, we need to be looking at okay, is there structure in place? Do they know when breakfast is? Is breakfast a consistent meal? What are they eating? Is it filling enough? And then when is lunch? What is that that time span between the two? And what kind of snack is appropriate in between? Because ideally, very similarly to what our kids follow during the school year, whether they be in daycare, preschool, elementary school, or intermediate school, they all have some sort of a daily schedule. They're not allowed to just bring snacks in and out of the classroom all day. And so that does help promote the appetite regulation. It does help promote, as you mentioned, the feeding skills and ultimately like what we in the feeding space often call is like eating competence. They're competent to know how to feed and fuel their bodies, but also how to do other things. And so I think if we can look at how do we space it in a way that's not calculative as if we have these robotic kids, but we look kind of backwards because a lot of kids will be front loaders. A lot of kids will want to eat more in the morning than they do in the afternoon or evening. And being in tune with that and saying, okay, this is a challenge because our kids eating so much the first half of the day that then come dinner, they don't want to touch anything. Okay, well, that is a problem. So how do we work backwards and reinforce the structure and routine to the day that helps it so they actually do want to come to the table with whatever appetite they're going to have that reinforces them wanting to stay seated at the table and they're not getting up two minutes into the meal and they're not trying any of these, you know, the one-time veggies might be offered that day and they're refusing, you know, there's just all these problems that kind of spiral from that. So I think As families go into summer, I would say number one is evaluate what some of your pain points or your problems are first. And then from there, work backwards to identify, is it most linked to the what, the when, or the where of feeding being the parent's job? Or is it a problem with if, whether, and how much? If you notice your kid's just eating only goldfish or something all day or something, that that might be where you need to reinforce the routine or structure. And then the third thing would be to start creating some structure around the day so that you can then kind of test and reevaluate as you go through it. Because every time we try something with our kids, we need to be tuned in with their body. We need them to be tuned in with their body. So if we can, you know, work through those three steps, find a routine and then try it, we can then kind of hypothesize, is this kind of breakfast going to help circumvent this endless need for snacks by 10 a.m. that then makes them not want to eat lunch that then makes it so they, you know, it just, it's such a domino effect, but I think if families can kind of go with that and then look at how do they, you know, how does that maybe mirror what they did during the school year? Maybe it is a similar schedule and that just seemed to work for your family. Parents can use that as a guidepost, or you might realize the summer schedule is way different. Your kid's waking up way later or dinner time is way later. There might be variances, but you can kind of always use that um, to test and change what you need to about like what an actual like time-based schedule might look like. But I think the rhythms and routines really are going to be impacted by those first two components first and foremost. 
that's a good reminder that we have responsibilities in this feeding relationship, but so do our children. And to look first to what is the problem that I'm facing and which of those categories does it fall under? Because it makes it so much more simple to approach and just then, because I think at least for me, I know even a couple of weeks ago before I kind of figured out what the problem was, I was sitting there going, this is not working for us. Like it's stealing the peace of our family, which is also another just great perspective to have. And I think just backtracking anytime we're facing something in parenting or just as a mom with our own life, personally, we have to take a step back and say, what is this doing for me or not doing for me? Like if I'm going to take this path on whatever it is I'm going to do, why, why am I doing it? What is it for? And constantly, my husband's really good about asking me that. He's like, what is this for? Like, what is the purpose of what you're doing? Cause I'm the kind of just do it because I'm supposed to do it or I know it's the right thing to do instead of actually figuring out, is it again, giving more peace to our family and our routine, or is it taking that away? And I think that's a great perspective to take. And then from there saying, what's the problem? Does it fall under one of my responsibilities, which is what they're eating, when they're eating or where they're eating the location, which obviously was the issue for us. And then just fixing that one problem. And what's crazy is I found these yesterday and I had kind of already been like, okay, like I'm, and I, I I was at that point where I was like going around and just picking up pieces of snacks everywhere or wrappers. And I was like, this is why, why am I like, why is it like this right now? This is not okay. So I said, Hey, we're going to have snacks at the table when we have snacks. And that was just a simple solution. And honestly, I started that a couple of days ago and it's, they already know that's what they're supposed to do. It only took a couple of days of reinforcement. My kids are four and two, like they've been snacking wherever they want for a while and it only took a couple of days. And I think it's like that a lot in our, in our minds <laughs> we'll go, okay, I know I need to make this change. And the hardest thing to do is just to do it and to start. But once we do, it's a lot easier than we thought it would be. Um, so what are some ways that if our kids are eating a lot between snacks and their, their routine, that schedule with their body is kind of off. Cause as you were saying it, I was like, oh yeah, if they're eating a bunch of snacks, then they're not hungry at lunch, but then they're hungry at snack time again and eating like a meal for snacks. And then they're not hungry at dinner. How can a mom shift that? Cause obviously with kids, you can't just go cold Turkey and be like, okay, no snacks starve and then have lunch. Like that's not the approach to take. So how can moms shift that schedule? If that's the problem that they're facing first, Yeah, the, absolutely. what is that? The when the, when problem. Yeah. And I think it's great because I think like you said, fixing that one thing just makes it feel so much more doable. So and I simple. Exactly. And I think you do such a great job of breaking that down in, in many capacities with your community. But I think that's why in the feeding space, we live in a very saturated world that there's so many different ideas and information out there, which I love. But I think one of the biggest challenges I see families having is that they're always starting with the what. I mean, 9.9 out of 10 times, someone is coming to me saying, hey, I want healthy, easy meal and snack ideas for my kids. That is always what people are asking for. But then they're frustrated because they're like, I have a thousand and a half pins saved on Pinterest with healthy this, that, and the other. I'm constantly liking it on Instagram or Facebook or finding ideas, but I'm not getting the, the peace and the effective outcome that I want. And I think that's where when, when you go into meals and snacks and you feel that level of dread or you feel that level of overwhelm, it's because you haven't simplified it to something that you can be really effective with. As you mentioned, you changed one thing and then in a positive direction, you saw the dominoes begin to fall. That it was like, as soon as I said, this is not where we eat, we bring it to the table. It automatically starts to circle back to that win component. And then when you're deciding when, all of a sudden it's automatically domino affecting to, well, what are we even offering here? Because you're here at the table. It's at a set time. If you get up from the table, it's not where anymore. So it's like, if we, if you're at this table and I have you sit for a certain amount of time, there's that chance to have families tune back in. And as you mentioned, your boys two and four, they've been doing it a different way for, you know, a few years now, but we can reinforce and we can teach our kids rather quickly appetite regulation. But it's something as adults, so often we've really never learned. We've put kind of arbitrary boundaries or rules or restrictions around our own eating habits. And so we all have our own kind of uh, disordered relationship with food in different ways that then it becomes kind of hard, or I should say overcomplicated with our kids, where with our kids, they're born with 
a functioning appetite regulation. It may have gotten, you know, bruised or broken in the process, depending on some of the feeding habits and behaviors that we've been using as a family, but it can very quickly resume a normalcy if we help facilitate that. So I think going to your question of the win, I usually recommend in the three parenting roles and responsibilities of what, when, and where, I usually recommend starting with where that circles back to when, and then you can look at what you're offering. Because with the parents, as I mentioned, when we start with what, it becomes so overwhelming because there's just always more ideas out there. But when you start with where in the summer specifically, we might be thinking, okay, well, we're going, where we are going to be is visiting. I know you just were on a beach trip. You know, it's like, we're going to be there. Well, that's going to change the when and the what, because when we're on vacation, it changes everything else about how we eat. Or we know we are going to be at the splash pad today for lunch. Well, that's going to change the when and the what. And so if families can say, we'll be at home. Okay. Well, where at home, where at home do your kids eat? Is it on the couch? Is it at the table? You know, looking through some of that, but then that automatically helps reinforce. It's like, okay, that you, it simplifies that enough and consolidates that enough that it seems manageable for moms. And so then they can say, okay, well, that was doable, much more doable than I thought. So now I can work to the win component. Now I can look at, well, when are they sitting down at the table? When are we going to have a snack when we're at the splash pad? When are we doing meals and snacks when we're on vacation, maybe with other people or on our own and the schedule may be different. And you can kind of start to craft your day. And you had mentioned before in my um, snack guide, you know, I have a template for families where they can kind of put hypothetical times or actual times of what their rhythms and routines. I usually tell families like, do what your normal routine is and then do any variation of that day. If you know some of the days it's like this, but a camp day where that your kid has to get up and out the door early looks like this, Days might look different, but it helps you to at least consolidate it. Because as moms, I think the overwhelm happens when it's just, you know, in premarital counseling, they said uh, men are like waffles, women are like spaghetti in terms of our brain. And my husband and I communicate like that all the time because for him, it's so compartmentalized. And, and me, I'm like, my brain is spaghetti. And some days I'll just, I feel that way. I'm like, I feel like my brain is a big old pile of spaghetti and everything's intertwined and everything's a mess. But to find that one little noodle out of the thing is like, just, it's impossible. And so I think sometimes that's what happens in feeding our kids. It just feels so intertwined and complicated and overwhelming that it's like, let's just slop this down and call it a day. Like I can't even deal with it. So I think if we can compartmentalize it, then that circles families back to reinforcing the what of, okay, well, we're going to eat snack at the house before we go to the splash pad. Okay. Well, what's the time window that we're even looking at? You know, the worksheet is intended to kind of help families work through that so they can see, is this a two hour time block between a meal and a snack, or is this a five hour? Well, that's going to impact what you're offering your kid. Because if you're trying to offer applesauce, they're going to need six of them to last maybe five hours, where if it's the hour before dinner, an applesauce might be completely appropriate so that it doesn't reinforce their coming to the table, not hungry and things like that. So I think if parents can kind of look at their summer and look at where their kid is eating, be it at camp, daycare, you know, out of town, in town, at the splash, but all the different variations that come with summer, then kind of try and consolidate. It doesn't have to be, this is at two o'clock. You know, most of us don't live in a, in a time where we have a bell outside the house and we ring it and our kids come, you know, run into the front door to eat at dinner time. That's just not the day and age most of us live in, but you can still kind of put a gray area around ish. Like I always say, just add ish to whatever time you put. And that means it may be plus or minus 15, 20, 30 minutes. But if families can just kind of start getting in the rhythm of having a routine, it will automatically start eliminating some of the issues that they see of we're either finding food all over or our kids are grazing all day. Because if you have a time block for when your kids are fed, chances are there's not grazing because, you know, like my kids, they know that there is a snack time, which means when it's not snack time, what we're not doing is snacking. It's not because that food is bad, unhealthy, not to be had. You need to feel guilty, shame or anything like that. It's just we're not meant to think about food all the time. And when our kids just kind of graze, it's like they never really get satisfied enough to move on to the next thing. So we can kind of consolidate some of that grazing, consolidate, you know, put our own mental energy as moms into meal and snack buckets and kind of waffle our think mental energy. So we're not thinking as like, this is, I'm overwhelmed and this is so aggravating and exhausting because I'm doing it all day long. It's more like, well, this is, you know three meals, two to three snacks, which don't get me wrong. I have three kids. It's still a lot, but it becomes much simpler and much more doable. I think once we start to compartmentalize those things. 
Yeah, definitely. I love the simplicity. So we addressed where, and then we addressed when let's talk about what real quick. I know a lot of moms want to start here, which is why we saved it for later in the conversation. But, um, when it does come to snacks and even mealtime, I mean, I know I can just speak from experience. I fall on like the same things. And they're usually after looking at your snack guide, those, those low level snacks, the like feed Jeff, if you're hungry and starving 15 minutes before dinner, here's an applesauce patch. It's like, that's what I rely on for snacks is stuff like that, or an apple or a string cheese, like little simple things that are very small. Um, partially because I don't have the most creative brain in the world. So I'm not constantly coming up with fun snack ideas that are also healthy, that are also going to sustain my children for like two hours who my children, they're boys. They never stop moving. They're hungry. Like, and when they're in a growth spurt, they're eating a lot of food and that's fine. Cause I know that's just how they function, but, um, what are some, just let's address the, what, what are some simple, simple. So you're not cooking a lot ideas that aren't just like the basics of here's a little protein bar, or here's an applesauce, or here's an apple, or here's a string cheese, like a little more sustenance in them. Um, but without the complication of, or does that exist? <laughs> Does yeah, it and exist, I think it, Ashley? <laughs> yes, it, it really does. But I think, like you said, as moms, we're looking for easy wins. That's what easy, we're looking for. Yeah. I mean, we want the silver bullet, easy win, you know, just easy button. Yeah. Or snack. sometimes it's because our kids are going and getting it and saying, I'm really hungry right now. I want this because it's also easy for them to like formulate in their head. Oh, I see it. I want it. Hey, mom, open this for me, please. Yes, exactly. And depending on the feeding temperament of the kids, I mean, there's a range of picky eating behaviors or really adventurous eaters. Yeah. Typically I work with families who have more picky eating. So it's like, I know the five foods my kids are going to go grab or that, that I grab because they're the ones that your kids eat without a fight that they're not going right. to you know, argue about that don't kind of make parents question their choice and like, well, I offered them something I know they wouldn't want to eat anyway. Right. So, and it's also like, I'm not going to, I don't have like the grocery store in my kitchen at all times, you know, yes. I buy what I buy and I'm not trying to go to the grocery store every day too. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Which is why yeah. I often say don't start with the what, because I feel like families could often yeah. think they need to go have a, a super expensive grocery haul. And then they, it's negatively reinforced because they bring all these healthy options home that they saw on this, that, or the other that mm-hmm. they should buy. And they offer it to their kids and their kids don't like it. And they're like, well, that stinks because I just spent $6 on a box of this. And it's still not getting me the results I want. So I think what families can do is recognize you do need different options. You do need that quick grab, easy option, or delegate to your child, to your spouse, to the babysitter, to whoever it might be with low to little effort. It's not realistic to think everything's going to be this like homemade snack or meal experience. So we do need some range in terms of the effort, mental or physical, that's required from us in order to execute the meal or snack. But beyond that, in terms of like snacking specific that I think can be really helpful is once you've decided that where and that when, you know, at least from a time-based perspective, how long does a food need to fuel your kid for? Because most often what happens is, you know, I know this is audio, so people can't see, but I'm kind of you know, moving my hands just to say that like, we're kind of just hovering over borderline hunger where our kids are never really even understanding what true hunger feels like. Because as moms, pretty much across the board, we all have this like deep innate understanding that it's our job to feed our kids. So at the slightest little remark of I'm hungry, we're like, oh, I must feed you. I must feed you right now. You must have something like this is, you know, me neglecting my role. If you even feel hunger rather than helping our kids understand how that is a good biological process, just like sometimes when we're potty training, yes, if our kid needs to use the restroom, we're jump on it and we're urgent, but there's also an element of you. Sometimes you need to be able to hold it a certain amount because that's life. The life, like There isn't, the world does not operate around our child's appetite levels. And so if we're setting them up for constant grazing and kind of that constant hovering on not full, but not hungry, they're going to want to fill up on fruit snacks and popcorn and pirate booty and applesauces and goldfish crackers and a string cheese here and there and a fruit leather there. And none of those foods are bad, but we're looking at what I would consider a level one food. They're only going to fill them up for a short amount of time. Or as you mentioned, they're going to lack some sustenance. So in the nutrition world, this is really like the protein, fat, or fiber. These are going to be the things that it may have one of them, but the food choice in and of itself is probably only going to fill our kids up for an hour or less. It's not going to satiate them for a long period of time. 
But if our kids are eating six of these in a row, well, we're looking at six level one snacks. Well, now they basically just ate a meal. Even if, though it was not the meal choices that we maybe have would have chosen for them, when we're not looking at the what appropriately, we can see, well, all my kid eats is the exact same foods I just mentioned, you know, but it's like, that's because they're just kind of hovering on that, not hungry, but not full line, where if we can kind of learn to help our children to feel comfortable with the bigger peaks and valleys or ebbs and flows of appetite regulation, we can help them understand things like you eat breakfast and then two hours later you have a snack just the way they would at school. And then a couple hours later you have a lunch. And then a couple hours later you have a snack. It's like, it goes up and down and up and down. So then when they are sitting and eating, they understand I, my opportunity here is to eat until a place that I feel comfortably full and that I feel that I have the energy to sustain me to the next eating opportunity. And so if families can kind of grasp that concept, it can automatically help us branch away from just what I would consider a level one foods. And I I spell out all these on my snack guide, but families can see those are fine options in certain applications, but oftentimes we need to branch out to what I would call a level two or a level three food Two being, it may have protein and fat or fat and fiber. It might have a few, but it's going to maybe hold kids over for give or take two hours Level three would be more of like what I would consider like a a mini meal. This might be a PB and J or, you know, bagel bites or whatever a family might kind of default to as a meal. But sometimes our kids need, I mean, as you mentioned with growing boys, sometimes they are going to need, I work with toddler boys. I work with teenage boys. You know, sometimes they just need more food, but if snacks are only considered a bag of goldfish or a fruit leather, it's going to take a lot of those to fill them up. So if families can kind of look at that time window and as they get comfortable with the kind of routine and rhythm of having gaps between eating opportunities and not allowing that grazing, what also happens is we start to tune into our child's appetite because the calculation of give or take a level one may satisfy you for an hour. It, it, it's impossible to account for an individual's appetite. So I can say if I'm super hungry, a level one is not, is going to be early make a drop in the bucket. But if my child, you know, we can, so it kind of plays around with it, but appetite regulation does take some time for the child to be in tune with and for the parent to respond to appropriately. So I look at it as time being the most helpful kind of metric, but then kind of dragging and dropping and playing around with different choices of snacks to see if this is almost like a mini meal and you're really hungry at morning snack, it may be more appropriate. Even if it is a shorter time frame. it may be more appropriate for you to have a really filling snack because you consistently have a really high appetite. And we don't want our kids to feel guilt or shame around that. We just want them to understand you have to fuel your body appropriately. And yes, you may have eaten majority of your calories for the day in the front half of the day. But what I often see being the problem is as parents, many of us were raised in the culture of 100 calorie like snack packs. So we all kind of think like, that's what a snack is. It's 100 calorie equivalent, which is not something I think our kids need to know. But I think that's where a lot of us parents are operating from when we think of offering a snack. Because if you look at any of those level one snacks, they're usually give or take around 100 calories. And that's like what we as parents feel comfortable with as a snack with where we're not tuning into what is biologically and physiologically more appropriate for a kid, which may be a level two or level three. So I know it's kind of a new way of thinking about the what component, but I've seen a lot of families have a lot of success with starting to kind of look at that where, when, what, and plugging in new options accordingly. And not only is it adding variety to their kid's diet and helping kind of branch out of some of those preferred foods that we reach for automatically, but it's also helping circumvent some of those things that, as we talked about at the beginning, are stealing the piece because we as parents feel frustrated when all they've eaten all day is basically snack foods, you know, and they're not, we're not um, achieving that appetite regulation that I know so many families are really after. This is so helpful. And even though like I've learned a lot of this from you and listening to your podcast, even the breakdown in this conversation is helping me realize, okay, here's like step one, step two, step three. And it's got me thinking now with, with the what piece. Cause I do think I mean, I know it's only been a couple of days, but my boys have adapted. They're very adaptable kids. And like the where and then the when, even after just a few days of saying, okay, we're gonna have snacks at the table instead of wherever you want in the couch um, or in the couch specifically, wherever you want in the house. um, I've been able to say, hey, I'm cooking dinner right now. 
which is always when they want snacks, which I'm sure is the appetite thing. Um, but I'll be like, okay, there's literally, I'm putting it on our plates. It's almost ready. Just hang on. It's kind of like when my four-year-old really has to go potty, but we're in the car at a red light. And I'm like, we can't go anywhere right now. Hold it. Um, I love that comparison, but it's got me thinking a lot of the times what I like to do now that we're kind of at that stage of really talking about when with my boys is I like to give them options too, because I want them to be decisive when they grow up, because that's something I personally have struggled with is decisiveness in my adult life. And I've learned just from different parenting experts and whatnot, that giving your kids choices that are, you're fine with whatever option it's like, Hey, or when you're going out the door, do you want to put your shoes on? Or do you want me to put them on for you? Instead of saying, Hey, we're leaving instead of me saying, you know, it's not snack time or, Hey, let's pick a health. Like instead of saying it in a, just a not developmentally healthy way for them, I'll say, cool, you're hungry. Do you want this or this or this? I'll give them like two or three options. Um, how would you approach doing that? Like, would you say two level one snacks? Would you offer them a level one and a level two? Should I, or any of my listeners, if they go get your snack guide, um, like print and laminate these snack guides and put them on the fridge and say, Hey, what do you want to choose? Like, what's a, what's a good approach to giving them choice around that in a way that, um, still gives structure to snack time, but is allowing them to tune in to their appetite. And cause like my four-year-old can see the difference between some grapes and he knows like some grapes versus a peanut butter and jelly. He knows the peanut butter and jelly fills him up more. He likes to make it. He knows what goes on there, but how would you go about doing, giving them choice in that as well within the structure of what, like when and where is already dealt with? So I think it's a great question because yes, one of the biggest parenting things I've learned was reducing it down to two things. You yes, know, when your child can't make choice or is struggling, it's okay. Can you do this? Or do you need me to do this for you? Because you're on mm-hmm. such a struggle bus, but sometimes in the feeding space, it might be, do you want apple slices or do you want grapes? Yeah. And I'll do that because they'll be like, can I have a bowl of cereal? Or I know they're going to ask for it. Or I know they know it's in there. And I'm like, I'd I'd rather have like fruit right now. So I'll say, do you want an apple or a banana? Like in the morning, we've got those like simply Cheetos, whatever with not the junk toxic ingredients in them. Um, Thankfully they started making those, but I know they like, they know they're in there, so they're going to want them, but I know it's almost breakfast time and they're hungry and I'm cooking breakfast. So do you want fruit instead? Do you want apple or banana? It's like, you know, kind of not controlling what they're having, but giving them better options. So in that sense. Yeah. And so often the reason we're having challenges in the feeding relationship with our kids is because they're deciding what, when, and where, Mm -hmm. and then we are trying to decide for them if they eat it and how much they eat. And it becomes, that's where it's like, (laughs) like depending on how, yes, depending on how many roles have been reversed usually is kind of the severity of the problems that I see with families. And so Giving two options, I always think, I think it gives parents two feet to stand on because I think when there's this, we all know the times that we've offered too big of an offer to our kids. And then we're like, oh, backpedal. That was a bad idea because now you're going to like ask for the moon and I can't hang it, you know? And so say, as you're, as you said, inserting a level one snack in something when you're going to eat in less than an hour, I'm making breakfast, but you wake up super hungry, insert fruit or vegetable. You can have this or this, but if we say, well, what do you want for snack? Or what do you want for breakfast? That's just so open-ended that as soon as my kid asks for French toast, and I was thinking like, we only have time to make toast in the toaster with butter. And you're asking me to like make this whole thing. I don't know why I even asked you because I actually can't do what you even want. And so now you're upset. I'm irritated. I'm questioning my thing. It's like, we get our feet knocked out from under us. So I think the AB options is always a great starting point when we're incorporating kids. That said, there is an element of what is the age and developmental stage of your child? Because as you mentioned, your four-year-old could get bread and peanut butter and jelly and has, you know, if they've been modeling that process with you, he may be able to make his own PB&J. So you can say, do you want a bagel and cream cheese or PB&J? And he may be able to help facilitate that process. But with a younger child, especially if they, you've never had any of these feeding roles or responsibilities established, you may need to just make more choices. Oftentimes I say, if you're seeing pushback with your child, or if you're seeing your child you know, have really extreme responses to the boundaries you're putting in place, you may need to offer more choice. And we, I mean, that's like toddlerhood 101, right? It's like when you can't get out the door and your kid refuses to put their shoes on all of a sudden now, instead of just putting their shoes on because they're not at an age or stage where they can put them on themselves, 
now we have to like make this a game and like say, do you want these shoes or these shoes? Do you want me to put them on? Do you want to put on? Do you want to stand up or do I need to carry you to the car? Like, you know, you have to break it down like as basic. And sometimes it's that way with feeding just to kind of get on the same team with them and just to get them to cooperate with the transition. So the same way as we all have to get out the door sometime with our kids and they are not cooperating, we all have to feed our kids. And sometimes they'll be really cooperative and interactive and you can just make those choices because the what that you are offering is ultimately up to the parent. But if you see your child kind of pushing back, I would say that's an opportunity in the moment or in advance to be offering this or that. So some families find it helpful in like the meal planning or before grocery shopping to invite the kids participation into what they're bringing into the home. So the kid feels like I have some control. I have some say my voice matters, but sometimes it's at the meal. If you're making something, and as you said, they want something totally different. It might be that in that moment, you don't necessarily care. Do they have potato chips or simply cheetahs? So it's going to be, okay, I can see that you're a little resistant to me having some control over this and that my job is to be in charge of what. So I'm going to give you a say in something that doesn't matter. Do you want water or milk? Do you want apple juice or orange juice? Do you want a satsuma or the banana? They both are equal effort, equal opportunities for you. It's not like you're saying, do you want me to make you a key lime pie or do you want an applesauce? Like they're not like, you know, I think so often it's like we have to give something that's like, it doesn't matter to me nutritionally energy effort wise, but we can then offer our kids some, um, some choice there. And it kind of gives them the chance to have buy-in. But I think as parents, when we narrow it down, it makes us feel calmer and more confident sticking with it. Because then when our kids, you know, if we say, do you want potato chips or Cheetos? And our kid says, well, I want a brownie. Well, I'm sorry. That's not an option today. We'll have a brownie, you know, tonight after dinner. But right now your choices are potato. You just, you always just keep referring back to what your options already were or deferring to another time. But I think when we can kind of get in that mindset of refer and repeat what you said or defer and follow up later, that can help our kids understand that they do have a say, but they're not in full control. Yeah. And I've done those types of options that you said, refer or defer, and I'll get a meltdown right there in front of me. And I'm like, Oh, I'm sorry. You feel that way. I understand it's frustrating. We can talk about it later, or you can pick one of these snacks, but (laughs) I know it's frustrating. It's like, I get it, especially because I haven't been doing these since day one. So of course there's pushback to that level of tantrum laying on the floor, especially with my second born who just feels really big. You know, he's got big feelings and I'm like, okay, like, you know, I've what's, what's the phrase built this bridge and have to walk across it too. I don't know the phrase. I'm so bad at those, <laughs> but based on made my bed and had to lay in it. That's it. Yes. <laughs> my brain doesn't work in those, but I love using them. <laughs> um, so I mean, real yeah. life, right. The realistic version is this is the way to do it, but you have to realize there's going to be meltdowns. You have to just, this is what I'm going to have to face. I made my bed. I have to lay in it, but it will work out. Like this will pay off long-term and think like, I always think my, my parents did an amazing job raising me, but you know, if there was this much intentionality put behind my experience with food growing up too, it would be different for me and what I experienced. And I always think about that. And I talk about that a lot too, on this podcast, it's like, you know, what we do now sets our kids up and just taking some time and some energy and some effort to be this kind of intentional. um, It's totally worth it. And I think actually what I'll do instead of putting the pages up on my fridge is sitting down when I grocery plan and say, Hey, you know, kids, what do you want for snacks this week? Let's pick a couple from this page, a couple from this page and a couple from this page. Oh, look, we already have some of these. Great. Let's make the grocery list because then they get, they know what their options are and they're going to love that. So And I think what you said too, a huge thing as moms, it's, we have to know the meltdowns and that, that, oh, this is so hard to stay consistent with doesn't last forever. I mean, Mm -hmm. if you're a new mom and you're like just starting to transition naps or nighttime sleep schedules, I mean, I feel like all of us, no matter what parents sleep training approach has been, we all know that, that there's that tug when you have to kind of start creating some routine and rhythms that just work for real life around mm-hmm. your child's sleep. Same when our potty training. I mean, I think those are all blocked out of my memory from the three potty training, three kids, because I'm like, those were not my favorite weeks of motherhood. And some of them lasted months, but you know, it's one where I'm like, but knowing it, the hard of this is not my favorite week or month 
didn't last for forever. And now I can just kind of block that out. But I think especially in feeding so often as moms, we just feel like we need to give in right away. And so it perpetuates the problem so much longer. And I think Mm -hmm. as moms, and especially this is something I wouldn't have understood earlier on in motherhood, but I can definitely see now and in raising my kids with these roles and responsibilities established is that, you know, one, I can see how many times we could have perpetuated picky eating just in our own family's tendencies and with my kids, more limited appetites. You know, I thought they were going to be these kale and quinoa eating kids, which has most definitely not been the case, but I can also see that like sticking to these boundaries as being the evidence-based gold standard of how to raise a child who has a healthy relationship with food is the end goal. And that is worth sticking to. That does not mean that I've never had pushback, but I will tell you with three kids, we very rarely really never have meltdowns. And even with my deep feeler, you know, like she has very big emotions. It's not really around eating. I mean, I can tell if she's hungry and maybe we've, you know, given her a level one when she needed a level three snack or it need to kind of adjust and adapt, but we're not having meltdowns. So that piece is not disturbed around the table because there is that routine. And so I think for families to realize if you are having the meltdown, know that I'm a mom too. Like my goal is never to have families have, you know, conflict or really um, challenging feeding environments. My goal is to establish and preserve and reinforce the peace in that feeding re- uh, relationship and environment. So if they don't have that, that's the goal of what we're getting towards, but it's a short, it's a short stint. And just like you can't let your child never know when to sleep appropriately or never know when to use the bathroom before leaving the house and things like that. We have to help equip our kids with these skills so that they know how do you eat as a human and how, how do you establish healthy habits in the process? And we have a role to play in that, but it's it's so easy, especially, you know, there's some days where we're just like tossing the towel. I don't have it in me. Eat that another applesauce pouch on the couch. But then we know that that, that can't be our default every day. So I think if families can just kind of be reminded that the pushback and the meltdowns, I mean, I work with this every single week with individual families that have a lot of different dynamics going on in each individual home. And I would say within a week or two, they're done. Even as you mentioned, it seems going into it like this is overwhelming. This might be a conflict. This is like a meltdown waiting to happen. This, I I have anxiety even just thinking about going into saying no more snacks on the couch. But then very quickly, you see kids love boundaries. They don't say they love boundaries, but kids thrive with them. And I think that's a consistent theme across all areas of parenting. And so we see that when we give boundaries around our kids' sleep, when we give boundaries around our kids' play choices, when we give boundaries around our kids' eating habits, all of those things reinforce a lot of the habits for proper development. That's going to help our child thrive and flourish more. Absolutely. Um, what if there's a mom who knows all this is dipping her toes into all of this, but she herself does not have the healthiest relationship with food, which I feel like is almost every mom of our age these days because of the, the culture we were raised in, which is fine. Um, it is what it is, right? We cannot change that. We can work on ourselves now and just move forward. But I know the heart of my listeners is to leave our kids better than we were in a sense of just have them lead a healthy life. That is, you don't have to think about it. They don't have to try. They're not constantly doing diets. Like they, we don't want that for our kids. No mom does really at the end of the day, they don't, we don't, we don't want our kids struggling with what we struggle with. And So if a mom's in that place where she's like, I still am not totally healed in all of this, I might have some disordered thoughts around eating. Um, You know, it's something, the hardest part about food and eating is you can't not eat. You have to eat, right? We have to eat to live. So it's not something like a poor relationship with social media. You can just take it off your phone and be done with it. Like you have to eat. So if a mom's in that place, can she do all of this still? Like what is what is her approach? What's your encouragement to that mom who's in that place? Yeah, absolutely. And I would just encourage that mom. You know, I think one of the best ways um, another mom asked me is she's like, can I, do I have to fix myself first before I can start any of this with my kids? And my answer is no, absolutely not. Because the reality is, is we're never going to quote unquote fix ourselves because we're going to continue to grow in our awareness of issues we didn't even know existed. And I think as moms, we see that, you know, I had really bad postpartum anxiety and it was one where I kind of wanted to be like, can't my babies wait until I get through this? And like, until I can show up in the way I want to show up, but they can't, babies are going to grow, you know, like we're in it and I have to work through it while still mothering. Like I can't do what fix one before I get to be a mom. That's just not how it worked. And as you said, 
we can't fix one and just like not feed our kids for like, not only do we have to feed ourselves, but we're responsible for feeding other humans. So we have to do it as we go. And I think that's why the more that families can realize you find the things that are the most manageable and the most like present issue. Try not to, I think it's important for families first and foremost, especially, you know, moms specifically to look and say, what do you not want for your child? Five, 10, 20, 30, 50 years from now, when they are in your shoes as a new mom, what do you not want them struggling with when it comes to weight, body image, eating habits, exercise routines, all of those things, because most often they stem to those things that are our innermost like wounds or scars of things that is like, we don't want them to face what we faced. And so now we're looking back and we're saying, okay, so, you know, maybe sometimes it's looking at our parents and we can see, oh, this is things they struggle with it. When our kids are 60 we, or 70, we don't want them struggling with this. Okay. Well, when they're 30 and a mom, what do they not want them? Well, when they're in high school, what do we not want to be just destroying their self-esteem or their confidence or their body image? Then it helps us look back and say, okay, so what are we doing now? Because time is going to keep ticking. Meals and snacks are going to keep coming and we have to keep addressing this. But what, what I see so often is the more families can stick to my role is what food is offered, when food is offered, where it is offered. My child gets to choose if, whether, and how much they eat. When we just keep coming back to that, and it's going to, it is an evolutionary process. It doesn't just click for everyone overnight, day one, and everyone's kumbaya about, you know, dinner time. But it helps families wrestle through the things that are resonating on a much deeper level than the food itself with themselves. So it helps surface some of those struggles or insecurities that a lot of moms feel of, well, I'm not comfortable with how much they're eating of that. Well, it's not up to you how much they eat of that. So if you're not comfortable with how much they're eating of that, is it a problem that's, you know, circles back to the rhythms and routines? And there is something that you can tr- control about what you're offering when you're offering it or where you're offering it. Or is it something that if it's not in your control, you need to work on because you're realizing every time your kid is around Oreos, it makes you painfully uncomfortable. Well, that's probably some inner work you need to do and not really about your child and their love of Oreos. It may be you need to, you know, change the what, when, and where of they're offered. But beyond that, if you've done your job, then your job really is to do some inner work and that self-reflection. Because so often when we stick to our job, it surfaces all the things that we want to control that we can't. It surfaces all those insecurities that we didn't trust in ourselves around those foods that now we see presenting with our kids. And so I think if families can really just work on establishing those feeding roles and trying to promote that feeding environment that is going to raise an individual that is free from some of those issues in adolescence and adulthood and, you know, as they get older, that's, that's what we're working towards now, but we also have to recognize what we can and can't control. And we can control some of those wounds that we notice. Wow. That really hit a sore spot for me. Like I didn't even know I had that bruise, but when we heal one area of our relationship with food, we have food freedom and how we parent our kids. And it's amazing. Cause even with me, I'm like, I would have said I'm good, but in feeding my kids. And because I do this professionally, I'm like, wow, I didn't know how many things I still needed to work through on my own that just presented in feeding my own kids as imperfect eaters and an imperfect eater myself, you know, there's always room for opportunity, but we have to keep feeding our kids. So I think for parents to just take one step forward, first and foremost, establish those roles and kind of get set in that routine. And then just take it one thing at a time when different aspects of your own relationship with food surface to start wrestling through this. And sometimes it is getting professional help. Sometimes it is just being honest with yourself of why am I so uncomfortable with this? Why Am I so paranoid that my child's obsessed with sweets? Why am I so uncomfortable when we go to someone's house and my child X, Y, Z is around food? You know, some of those things, if we can be honest with them, then we often don't react. You know, we all know that like as moms, we can be triggered by different things in different situations, but food is definitely something that can be really triggering. So if you notice yourself being triggered, pausing and looking at it and looking at it, is this something that stems back to a what, when, where that I do have control over? Or is this something that I really need to control about my past or my present relationship with food that I can overcome so that my child doesn't struggle with it the way that I do? So helpful. Uh, when it comes to final two questions, um, cause one will be around tough love, but I do want to ask you, cause we're about like simplifying things here and making sure that you're at a place when you start something that it's doable for life. So what would you tell moms listening based on what we talked on today? 
they want to get to the point where the kids have this healthy, healthy relationship with food for life, where do they start today? What's like one thing they can do literally starting after they finish listening to this episode to get on that path with their children? I would probably say for families to look at, if you were talking to your best friend and you were saying the most frustrating thing that happened today, yesterday, or this week in feeding your child, what is that one thing? And what's the one thing you can do about it? Because I think we become so lofty and we become so grandiose in our, in our ideals, but really it's not one thing that's 500 things. And I know that because I live it and walk it every day. When I look at all the different things I've had to do to try and foster that for my family, I don't honestly know that I could ever boil it down to one thing. And I think every season is different. Every child is different. There's just so many variables, but I think with where you're at right now, whether you've ever done any of the things we talked about today or not, you can do one thing. You can pick what is that one thing that right now is my Achilles heel that makes me resent, hate, dread, whatever it might be, feel overwhelmed about feeding my kids. And what can I do about it in my role and responsibility? And what's the one thing I can do? Because again, I think as soon as you do that one thing, then as you know, it's hard until it's not. I know you and I both know that phrase well. And so it's hard until it's not. And once it's not hard, then ask yourself that again. What is the thing that's creating the most problems or disturbing the peace around meals and snacks in our home the most? Okay, well, let's address what that one thing is. Because if we narrow it down and break it down to simplifying it to one thing and not all the issues and not all the past issues, all the present issues, all the future issues. And now we're also comparing it to everyone else's issues because we're very aware of everyone else's life and what they feed their kid and what they sent and who's bento box and everything like that. No, no, put blinders up to all those other things. Just look right now. What is the thing that is compromising my ability to show up as my best self at this next meal or snack? And if you can be honest with yourself about that, I think it will help you put one step in, you know, one foot in front of the other for the journey ahead of raising that child that you get to say, you know what, I did the best I knew how to do. And I, I'm going to learn as I go. But if I can do that one thing, I think parents will start to feel it's a lot more manageable and it's a lot more sustainable of a process. And then what tough love do you want to leave the moms with? Just some encouragement that straight from the heart, because you love these listeners, but you know, you're not being around the bush. You're just going straight to the point because sometimes we just need to hear her like that. I would say feeding our kids is not easy, but we can make it simple Mm -hmm. because I think we don't want the struggle. We want to make feeding our kids easy. And oftentimes when we make it easy, we're kind of leaning on a crutch that's perpetuating problems and we're taking the easy way out. And I think knowing your listeners are willing to, you know, take in some of that tough love. I think if they're willing to say, I'm willing to do the hard thing, I'm willing to help spare my child of some of these challenges that I may have faced. I'm willing to set my child up for a healthier future in their own relationship with food, but it's going to require work. You know, we don't show up running a marathon without training and we are in training by feeding our kids. And whether we like it or not, you know, just like we have to run our miles every day for, you know, a running race or something like that. We have to do the meals and snacks each and every day. And it's not, it's not going to be easy. There's definitely things we can do to simplify it. There's definitely rhythms and routines we can get in as a family to make it feel like less of a burden on our shoulders. I am all for efficiencies and organizations that help with those systems and strategies, but we can't just always go for what's easy. We just need to look at how can we make it simple? Yeah. And simple is where, when, what, and when it comes into that, what it's not Pinterest and Googling and Instagram searching all these fancy toddler ideas. It's thinking about, okay, is this a level one, two, or three snacks. So real quick, share with the listeners what the snack guide is that we've been referring to and where they can connect with you as well. Yeah, absolutely. So my website, veggiesandvirtue.com, you can get the snack guide for free there. It's like a nine page download. It's all free access to you, but it'll give you some of the snack ideas that are going to help, you know, span different timeframes as you help your child develop that appetite regulation. So I'm sure you'll probably link it in your show notes, but you can get it at veggiesandvirtue.com slash snack guide download it there. And as you said, Liz, you can, you know, print it out, involve your kids in it and give them the opportunity to say, Hey, what are two to three things from this from level one snacks that you want this week for me to get at the store? And then when you have them in the home, you know, it can just be a really easy next step because going into summer, I know that snacks are hard for people. And so that's why I really wanted to put this resource together for families, Um, but they can get it there. I reference it on my podcast, the veggies and virtue podcast often as well. So there's always links to it there. 
Um, and I'm sharing different bits and pieces of it over on my Instagram as well, um, which is at veggies and virtue. Yes. Simple to remember across the board. I just want to thank you today for being on here, Ashley, and sharing all of this with the listeners. And I just want to give you um, a word of thanks for what you do, because I feel like we have a very similar approach to our audiences and our listeners, um, just in two totally different categories of what moms need to hear about. And I just appreciate the way you approach motherhood just as a mom and knowing you as a friend, but also uh, how you approach it as a professional, because we need to hear the evidence-based things. We need to hear the what to do because we want to know, like moms want to be educated, but we also need that realistic bent of everything because we are in the trenches in the moment as well. We're doing the hard things day in and day out, whatever that hard is that day. And I know you know that because you live it, but you also bring it into what you teach. And I just want to thank you for doing that and for bringing that here to this podcast and these listeners. Um, all you guys go follow her, go listen to Veggies and Virtue podcast if you don't already and go back to episode 54 too to get even more gold from Ashley because um, she's just awesome and she's got so much wisdom to share. So thank you for being on today, Ash. Thank you. Such a sweet, encouraging word and very thankful to get to be here with you and your community. Before you go, thank you for spending this time with me on the Tough Love Mom podcast. If this episode encouraged you in any way, the number one way you can thank me is to leave a review, letting me know how this show has impacted you. Then send this episode to another mom friend or take a screenshot, post it on social media and tag me so I can personally thank you for helping me on this journey to impact thousands of moms. I'm so grateful to be on this journey with you, sister. Until next time, get after it.